Okay, it's 12 noon. Welcome. Let me welcome everyone who's come. I'm very pleased to see so many of you here today uh, in person, and we have several online. So for their benefit, I'm Vivian Fonseca from Tulane University. I know it's LSU Grand Rounds, but this is part of the LA Cats retreat, and we're very pleased that you've been able to join us today. And very pleased that we have an outstanding speaker, Dr. Russell Rothman, is Professor of Internal Medicine, Pediatrics and Health Policy, Ingram Professor of Integrative and Population Health, and Senior Vice President for Population and Public Health at Vanderbilt University. He has a long CV, very distinguished career. I'll just summarize very briefly. Uh, he's a director of an institute there uh, that engages over 250 faculty involved in research and education related to global health, epidemiology, health services, research, health policy, ethics, biostats, et cetera. And he's, had a, he, he's been very involved with large research networks, such as the STAR network that has Vanderbilt, Duke, UNC, Wake Forest, South Carolina, and others. Uh, he's been a very good collaborator with us at ReachNet, and I'm glad to see some people from ReachNet here. And um, he has had uh, over $80 million in funded research and, and 170 publications over the last few years. He's been very active at, at PCORI. He's been serves as the chair of the PCORI, PCORNet Executive Steering Committee, which is a national network of over 60 health systems that sub supports comparative effectiveness using EMR data. And we are very pleased to be part of that. He's been involved with other large PCORI related studies such as Adaptable. He's now working on a COVID-19 project with diabetes that I'm very pleased to be working with him on. So welcome, Russell. Thank you very much for coming. And I'll hand this microphone over to you. Please scan your QR code if you want CME. Thank you, Vivian, uh, for the introduction. It's really a pleasure uh, to be with you here today in person in New Orleans. Uh, really enjoyed uh, the hospitality uh, last night and today. And I'm uh, delighted to uh, present to you today, see if I can get there we go, slides in motion. So um, I am going to talk today about addressing individual and population health in a learning health uh, community. Um, the, uh, this is just the standard announcements from LSU for the CME for today. And um, the, the standard uh, disclosure uh, announcement uh, and any disclosure that I have, which is just related to grant support has been mitigated. Um, and this is my, my previous and current uh, funding support to disclose. So let's go ahead and get started. And I think uh, many of you are aware that we face a lot of challenges to public health, population health, individual health globally, um, but particularly in the United States, um, despite the fact that we spend more per capita than, than anywhere else on the globe. Um, and this um, slide just shows life expectancy at birth um, in the United States compared to other comparable uh, uh, countries. And you can see over the last 40 years, life expectancy has actually um, dropped compared to other countries. For the first time um, in our country's history, kids born today actually have lower life expectancy than the generation before them. The big dip at the end really is, is related to COVID, uh, but even without that, we were starting to see a decline. And we also know that uh, a lot of these uh, differences uh, are related to pretty significant health disparities um, in this country. And, and just where you're born can make a difference upon your life expectancy. So 
you know, as you can see in the Southeast, including in Louisiana, we uh, have a lower life expectancy than other parts of the country. I, I live in uh, Tennessee, that uh, little blue dot in the middle of Tennessee there is actually, um, I don't know how to get over to that part of the screen, but that little blue dot is uh, Williamson County, just south of uh, Nashville. Um, so a lot of things impacting health in this country and you know, while genetics may explain a small part of that, and a lot of it is uh, driven by issues of social determinants of health, issues of healthcare delivery, um, and uh, other factors. And I'm going to try to touch on a lot of those things and how we address them today. Um, traditionally, we create evidence in science and we try to use that evidence to deliver care. But I think many of us know we often fall very short in getting evidence into practice. So, um, and even when we get that evidence into practice, we, we often don't do a great job delivering it in an equitable way. So there's a lot of opportunity to do research to really improve how we deliver care to improve care for both individuals and for patients and families. And one approach that's really become popular in the last um, decade or so has been the concept of the learning health system model. And so AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, defines a learning health system as a health system in which internal data and experience are systematically integrated with external evidence and that knowledge is put into practice. So traditionally, a learning health system model really involves embedding research into the healthcare delivery system to try to figure out how can we take known evidence and improve how we deliver care to improve um, outcomes. And, um, Can folks hear me? Can they hear me online? Yes. All right, sorry, we had a little technical challenge there that hopefully gave you a second to read this slide. Um, so learning health systems are systems in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement, innovation, and equity with best practices and discovery seamlessly embedded in the delivery process, individuals and families as active participants in all elements and new knowledge generated as an integral byproduct of the delivery experience. And underpinning this vision is an appreciation that health is shaped by many forces, genetic predisposition, social circumstances, physical environments, behavioral choices, and medical uh, care. And many people um, think about or have seen the learning health system sort of described as a cycle where you design an intervention within a, a system, you implement it, you evaluate it, you adjust as needed, and then you um, disseminate. Uh, we've argued that a learning health system can be broader than that. Learning health systems represent opportunities, not just to bring known evidence into care, but also to um, do studies 
that innovate and 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 test new ways uh, to deliver care, but also test what uh, may be the best uh, interventions for care. Um, but also very important when we think about health system, we also need to think about the community, not just the hospital or the clinic, but the entire community within which it serves and how that community may be able to be um, involved as well. And we always need to remember that, you know, patients and their families, they may only spend 1% at most of their time actually coming to the health system. The other 99% of the time, they're at school, they're at work, they're at home. So if we're really going to impact health, we need to think about it, not just as a learning health system, but really a learning health community. At Vanderbilt, we've built a pretty large learning health ecosystem that allows us to do quality improvement interventions across our health system and into the community, to do effectiveness research, and to do dissemination and implementation science. And we have a bunch of cross-cutting resources that really helps us to do this work. And I'm going to touch on a few of these resources in my presentation. Um, one of the things I'm gonna talk about is the Institute for Medicine and Public Health, uh, which I serve as the director for. Our, our focus really is on translating knowledge into better health. As uh, Vivian mentioned, we now engage over 300 faculty across many departments involved in a large array of research. Um, and we also support some educational PhD and MPH programs. And we provide uh, primary space resources and support for numerous other centers um, across the institution, including our Center for Health Services Research, our Center for Epidemiology, Ethics, Global Health, and our Memory and Alzheimer's Center. And we also help to provide support for, for, for our departments and really engage our academic departments and our health system in research and training. So we really act as the intellectual milieu for anyone that wants to do research in those broad spaces. Um, we help to recruit faculty and trainees. We um, provide pilot funds. We run a lot of enrichment programs. We provide administrative and grant management support space and other resources. And we provide some cores. So, you, you know, this is something a lot of the CTSAs now rely on is building out cores. And a lot of sites will have uh, imaging cores, hormone assay cores. We really built out cores to support research in this broader population health space. So we have cores that people, investigators can leverage in biostatistics. We have a survey core that does surveys seven days a week. We have a health policy database core, health communication and implementation science cores, and other cores to really help investigators do research. And we run, as I mentioned, a host of graduate uh, education programs and training programs to really um, build a robust uh, number of trainees and faculty in this research area. So let me transition now and talk about some actual examples of projects that we've done that sort of um, work into this learning health system space. And I'm going to share a few projects that I've led um, related to issues of addressing social determinants of health. Mike Switch. So, 20 years ago, uh, Terry Davis, uh, who's uh, recently retired from LSU Shreveport and others in the field really helped to bring to light the importance of addressing uh, health literacy as an important social determinant of health. Um, we now know that there's over 90 million Americans with only uh, basic literacy skills. 
literacy level at about the eighth grade, about 110 million Americans with low quantitative skills. Um, we have about 20 to 30 million Americans with limited English proficiency, what we used to call English as a second language. But even people with good literacy skills can struggle to navigate what's become a very complex healthcare system. And most people, when they hear the word literacy, they just think it means whether or not someone knows how to, how to read and write. But literacy is actually a host of different skills. It includes one's listening and speaking skills or oral literacy, writing and reading skills or print literacy, numeracy or math skills, which come up quite a lot in healthcare and cultural and conceptual knowledge. And literacy is actually a functional skill. So it's the ability to read or be told something, to take that information in, process it, and then act on it in an appropriate way. And we did a series of studies really um, documenting that many patients um, and families really struggled to understand common things that they might be uh, exposed in in healthcare, uh, things like reading food labels, understanding portion size, reading over-the-counter medications and figuring out how to take them correctly for themselves or their child, even just like mixing up baby formula. Many people were struggling to understand and follow instructions correctly. And we specifically focused in diabetes and found that many of our diabetes patients were really struggling to do things that we thought they knew how to do in the medical profession. So struggling to understand their glucose meter reading back when we were using lots of glucose meters and before CGM, uh, continuous glucose monitors, struggling to read food labels and understand their carbohydrate intake, struggling to figure out how much insulin they should take based on their blood sugar or their diet. And we showed people's ability to understand and perform these tests was highly correlated to their underlying numeracy or math skills. And it was also correlated with their overall blood sugar control. So after we showed that literacy and numeracy were important social determinants in how people were doing with their diabetes, we decided to do some interventions to see if we could make a difference. So our first intervention, this was actually in North Carolina. We took over 200 patients with type two diabetes that was in poor control. And we randomized them to initial education with a pharmacist who was also a certified diabetes educator. And we randomized them either to usual care with their primary care provider or to an intensive uh, disease management intervention that highlighted addressing literacy issues by using simplified education materials, decreasing jargon, using a technique called teach back, where if you teach something to a patient, you ask them to teach it back to confirm understanding and other approaches. Um, and at the end of the study, we found pretty significant improvements in blood sugar control, blood pressure control, getting people on aspirin, um, and some modest but not quite significant improvements in cholesterol. And when we stratified out the results by literacy status, what we found was the high literacy patients who were in our study, um, who got the intervention shown here in red, um, did a little bit better than the usual care patients. But the low literacy patients who got the intervention really did a lot better. And we felt like we were really taking these low literacy patients, which were two thirds of the population, and we were empowering them to better participate in their health care, and they improved um, concordantly. We followed this up with a second study, trying to more focus in on the math skills that patients with diabetes needed to see, can we really um, improve outcomes if we focus in on teaching them to address some of the math issues in diabetes. So we designed a low literacy toolkit. We used a lot of color coding to explain things, put text at the fifth grade uh, reading level, um, used a lot of pictures to explain key concepts, 
simplified things out into step-by-step -step instructions. And again, at the end of this trial, we were able to show that those that got the intervention had significant improvement in their blood sugar control compared to those who did not get a numeracy sensitive intervention. And then we followed this up with another randomized trial um, where we wanted to more specifically look at the nutrition education we were giving our diabetes patients and see um, if how we delivered the education made a difference, if we made the education more sensitive to people's uh, math skills. So uh, we randomized patients into three arms. One arm continued with usual care with their PCP or endocrinologist for their diabetes and had three sort of um, uh, control visits with uh, non-nutrition education. And then uh, the, the middle arm had continued with their PCP or endocrinologist, but also had three visits with a dietitian who was a certified diabetes educator and taught them about nutrition education or medical nutrition therapy focused on counting the number of carbohydrates they were taking in. So very math heavy focus, grams of carbs based on food intake. And the third arm, we went to a much simpler method, which people refer to as the plate method, where you basically say, you know, for each meal, take your plate of food, make half of it free foods, no carb foods, a quarter of it protein and a quarter of it carbs and don't pile the plate uh, too high. So, um, so this is what we did. And at the end of this study, we found that first of all, those who got certified diabetes education had more significant improvement in their blood sugar control than those who didn't get certified diabetes education. But we also found that among the people who got carb counting, the more complex skill, those with high numeracy did fine in improving their blood sugar control, but those with low numeracy struggled. Whereas the plate method, which was the simpler approach, both the high numeracy and low numeracy patients did equally well in improving their blood sugar control. So the simpler method seemed to do better um, over, overall. So we, we were feeling pretty good about all these studies showing that addressing literacy was important. It made it into the ADA guidelines at the time. Um, and then we followed it up with a study partnered with the Tennessee Department of Health, where we went out to 10 community clinics that are run by the Department of Health that see about 90% uninsured patients, very um, under-resourced population of patients, including um, English and Spanish speaking patients in, the, in this community. And we did a cluster randomized trial testing a broader education intervention, training all the providers in low literacy communication skills, giving them a very big toolkit to use at five of the clinics versus standard of care at the other five. And at the end of the study, we found that our intervention, both sides got better, but our intervention was, was not more successful than just the standard group, which got basic education from the National Diabetes Education Program. So what went wrong? Well, you know, in the nice academic clinic, we, we had more resources, we had more insured patients, you know, more, they had more ability to access and follow recommendations. When we brought it out to the uh, health department clinics, you know, we had a lot of under-resourced patients, large amount of food insufficiency, trouble accessing food, trouble accessing medication. So, you know, this is just a lesson learned when we do these types of projects, we really need to think of the full sort of socio-ecological model and what are the other things at play or, you know, put another way, there are implementation science frameworks that you can can really put to play when you design an intervention in a health system or in the community to really make sure you're thinking about what are the other factors that might be impacting outcomes of care that you need to try to address. 
So this is another series of studies we did, again, embedded into healthcare, trying to see if we could help prevent obesity in kids in the first two years of life, because we now know that about 25% uh, of toddlers are overweight or obese in this country. Um, you know, um, and of course we have a much larger epidemic of obesity um, in adults. And so we wanted to see if we could get families started on healthy habits early in the first two years of life to try to uh, prevent them from becoming overweight or obese by the second of year of life. So we trained um, residents, um, and this was a cluster randomized trial at four primary care resident clinics. We enrolled 865 English and Spanish speaking families at two months of age, followed them until two years of age, and at the Intervention sites, we train the pediatric residents in effective health communication skills. We gave them these toolkits to use with the families to set goals. And you can see the, the focus was not on weight uh, gain prevention. The focus was on growing healthy. These are steps you can do with your child to help them grow strong and healthy. Um, and then we had an active control arm where those sites focused on injury prevention. And what we found at the end of this study is the first 18 months that the kids were in the study, we did see improvement in their uh, weight gain trajectory. So they gained less weight than the control kids. But by 24 months, they had regained and were back similar to their counterparts in the control group. So again, this gets back to this concept of the learning health community, because if for those of you who have pediatric experience or remember bringing your kids for all their well child checks, they come in at two, four, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 months, they're getting lots of encounters with their pediatrician or clinician but then we don't see them for six months. And that's exactly at the same time, a lot of them are entering daycare or eating more and more solid foods, fast food, you know? And so we were losing these kids and their families just to the, the larger environmental uh, factors. So um, we're now doing another trial, which is just ending that, involves six sites. This was a patient lever level randomized trial. And we randomized the families either to get sort of the basic green light toolkit or to get uh, the toolkit plus a pretty intensive um, uh, text messaging intervention where the families are asked to set goals every two weeks during the course of time that they're in the program. So we'll see soon if this was able to make a difference and really engage them when they're outside the health system. All right, I wanna switch uh, gears again and talk a little bit about our um, Learning Healthcare Center at Vanderbilt, which is part of our CTSA. It's part of the Vanderbilt Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. And the focus of this um, program is really on embedding pragmatic clinical trials, pragmatic randomized trials into the health system. So we have members of the health system, uh, actual, you know, CEO, the chief nursing officer, departmental um, operational leaders, not, not academic leaders, operational leaders, as well as investigators come to us with ideas. They recognize problem or they recognize an opportunity and they bring to us an idea and say, can we test this in the health system? And we provide the resources and support and embed these fairly rapid projects into the health system, often as cluster randomized trials where we've been able to, to waive consent. Um, and uh, we've actually, this slide's a little bit old, but we've done about 20 projects this way right now. We have a bunch more in process, but I'm, I'm going to 
Uh, these are just a couple of examples. We've done two trials. I'm going to highlight in a second, looking at the role of crystalloid, uh, balanced crystalloids versus saline. And uh, we've done a randomized trial on the role of post-discharge phone calls and whether or not those would uh, reduce readmission. They, they did not. And uh, we did one um, comparing soap and water versus chlorhexidine in the ICU for preventing bloodstream infections. We did not see a significant difference between the two approaches, even though some prior studies had suggested that chlorhexidine was better. We felt it was mainly just cleaning off the uh, contaminants, not actually preventing BS bloodstream infections. But the one I'll highlight is uh, this SMART trial. And I'm, I'm an internist, so I grew up on, on saline. So this study is hard for me to present. Um, but we did a randomized trial um, looking to see what is the better IV fluid to give to patients, saline or balanced uh, crystalloid, particularly related to incidents of, of death or uh, kidney um, disease. And we did this study in our ICUs. So basically it was a, a cluster randomized crossover design where some ICUs for a month gave crystalloid while the others gave saline. And then we flipped it and the ones giving crystalloid gave saline and the ones giving saline gave crystalloid. And we were able to very, very rapidly um, perform this study. So um, less than two years later, you can see we had over 15,000 patients included in the primary analysis. And we were able to show um, <laughs> that those that got the balanced fluid did have um, significantly, at least, well, statistically, and many would argue clinically significantly less incidence of um, the primary outcome, and particularly less incidence of some of the renal uh, dysfunction. So, you know, you do a trial, you get results, but it's not successful if you haven't actually changed healthcare. So, the next step really becomes, okay, we showed this drug, this, that crystalloid is a benefit. Now can we get the health system to actually use it instead of normal saline? So this shows you um, in um, our medical ICU what happened. And so during the trial, sorry, I can't get the um, arrow to, I'm not sure how to get the arrow to show. But during the trial, that up, down, up, down, up, down is the randomization process where the unit keeps going from giving all saline to giving all uh, balanced crystalloid. And then we you know, added a little uh, order force in EPIC. And that's when you start to see some drop in the use of normal saline the paper was published, we got a little bump up in people giving <laughs> saline who maybe didn't believe it. Um, but ultimately we, we did some other interventions to get uh, the unit to really switch over. And we looked at this across the entire institution and you can see at various points, we had to do additional interventions in order to really get people to switch over to the balanced crystalloid. So this green is that they were doing a good job giving the balanced crystalloid. And you can see this is when the study was published in New England Journal. You know, we had a group like this GI endo lab that was still using normal saline. We changed their order <laughs> mechanism and suddenly they, they made it into the green. So, you know, you need a monitoring process. You need a process. And this is why it's so important when you design these trials that you start with the health system and they're on board on the front end. And you talk about what are we going to do if the results show A versus B. There are a lot of methods that 
need to be used um, to be a learning health system. So I showed you a lot of randomized trials, but I want to emphasize that you're not always going to be able to do a randomized trial. You're not always going to want to do a randomized trial. Sometimes the health system needs an answer in six months. So you really need to be thinking about a whole host of methods that might be needed to uh, embed um, projects into the health system or the health community to understand and improve care. We recently were funded by AHRQ to really build out our training of um, uh, faculty, junior faculty in this space. So um, we are gonna be supporting five health system scientists a year, two at 75% effort, like a traditional K award E but three at 35% effort that are really operational scientists that are gonna really embed straight into the health system and focus on addressing a health system priority. This is building off our prior K-12 in learning health system that we also had from AHRQ. And I just give one quick example of a project we did embedded in the health system around delabeling penicillin allergy. The large majority of people who think they have a penicillin allergy do not have a penicillin allergy, right? They got penicillin as a kid. The penicillin or amoxicillin was less um, pure back then, or most of the time the child got a virus or they got a virus associated exanthem with exposure to the antibiotic, but it's not a true anaphylactoid type allergic reaction, they can be exposed to penicillin again. But, you know, many people think they, they have a penicillin allergy. So we went into the ICU and we, uh, they developed an algorithm to identify people that have the types of history I described who would be low risk for a penicillin allergy. They identified 240 people um, 85% of them agreed to just an amoxicillin challenge. We just gave them a pill and um, only one developed a rash of potential concern. The other 99.5% we were able to delabel that they had a penicillin allergy. And we're now expanding this in a, a step wedge um, study across the ICUs and we're working on a new intervention into the general wards um, and potentially out to the clinics because you know people with a uh, penicillin allergy on their chart, it can cause a lot of challenges in terms of getting them the right antibiotics. Ooh. Finally, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our STAR Clinical Research Network, which um, Vivian alluded to, so we're one of eight clinical research networks funded by PCORI to really support uh, comparative effectiveness research and pragmatic clinical trials and other pragmatic research. ReachNet, which is uh, led by uh, the Louisiana Public Health Institute and, and Tom Carton, engages many of, of the groups on um, this grand rounds today in um, the Southern United States. Our network um, involves Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt Health Affiliated Network, Meharry Medical College in Nashville, um, Duke, uh, UNC, Wake Forest, Health Sciences of South Carolina, uh, Mayo Clinic, including their sites in Minnesota, Arizona, and Florida. And we recently added um, Essentia Health, which is a large rural health system in northern Minnesota and North Dakota, and Stanford. Across those sites, we have electronic health record data on over 15 million unique uh, patients with data going back to 2004 that we can leverage for many different kinds of research. So we can do secondary data analyses on that research. Um, we can, uh, it's identifiable data. So we can identify patients with certain conditions, contact them and recruit them into surveys, cohort studies or pragmatic clinical trials. 
and all of the um, health systems participating in PCORnet, including all the ones in ReachNet, have taken their electronic health record data and standardized it to the same exact data model so that we can write one query, send it to all of our data marts, our 10 data marts in STAR or to over 60 data marts across the country and um, able to do more rapid uh, research in that manner. This just shows you the number of patients and encounters in our various data marts in STAR. And um, you can see, for example, Vanderbilt has close to 3 million patients in our common data model going back to um, 2009. Um, and some of these are growing very rapidly as their health systems continue to expand. And we also have capacity to link that electronic health data to other data sources so that we can get more complete data about our patients. Um, every project that we do in STAR and across PCORnet is patient-centered and therefore really requires a stakeholder engagement. And this really wraps around back to my comments at the beginning about the learning health community. If you're doing an embedded project in a health system or in the community, you, you need the stakeholders. They, you need their input, including patients and their families. Otherwise, you may not uh, end up with a sustainable plan after your study is done. So it's really valuable to bring stakeholders to the stable, help them generate research questions and ideas, help them participate in the implementation of the study and help them with dissemination of results. To date, we've had over 400 requests to use our network. Over 120 of them have been funded, some from PCORI, some from NIH, some um, from other funders, including some from industry. And I'll highlight a couple of projects in the remaining time. So uh, some of you have heard of the adaptable trial, which was the first large pragmatic trial that we did in um, PCORnet. And we really wanted to understand in patients with known coronary heart disease, what's the optimal dose of aspirin that they should be on to help prevent any future heart attacks or strokes? Should they be on a baby aspirin or should they be on a regular strength aspirin? At the time, 40% of the time, clinicians were recommending regular strength aspirin and 60% they were recommending baby aspirin. So there was equipoise. We didn't know the answer. And it's possible the smaller dose, I mean, the higher dose may prevent more heart attacks and strokes, but at the expense of more bleeding, we, we didn't know. So very simple, pragmatic trial. We identified a lot of people electronically over 650,000 potentially eligible patients across 40 sites. Some were recruited in person, but many we recruited electronically. We contacted them electronically and said, hey, you know, you're someone who has heart disease. Would you be interested in participating in this study and being randomized to taking over-the-counter baby aspirin or regular strength aspirin? And we were able to fairly inexpensively and rapidly enroll 15,000 patients with e-consent and um, follow them over time, both by survey, but also by looking at their electronic health record data. And um, uh, Vanderbilt was, was the top recruiter in this study, so we're very proud of our performance. Um, at the end of the study, we, we actually did not find that one was superior to the other. Um, some would argue that means you should go with 81 milligrams, but bas basically we, we found um, results were pr fairly similar between 81 or 325. And I think importantly, this was published, but then it's like, how do we share to the community? So we did a lot of work returning results to participants sharing results with plain language media. We had a stakeholder engagement group that we called the adapters 
And our, the patients went out and shared the message. They came to the AHA meeting, they came to the American College of Cardiology meeting, and they shared the results out to the community. We're currently doing another um, randomized trial funded by the NIH, looking at the role of statins to prevent uh, dementia in the elderly. So uh, this study has already recruited about uh, 8,000 patients over 75, making it the largest uh, trial of, L of patients over 75 um, ever, ever done in the United States. And um, we're trying to see if statins can help to prevent dementia um, in the elderly. And then this is a study we've been doing for the last two to three years called Active 6, also funded by the NIH, looking at the purpose of refund, of looking at the effectiveness of repurposed medicines for treating outpatient COVID. So this study is also highly leverages informatics. We identify many patients who test positive for COVID electronically at many of the sites, contact them electronically, ask them if they wanna participate in the study, if they do, they e-consent, they get randomized to either receive drug or placebo by mail. They receive the drug within three days of consent. They take the drug or placebo and they fill out forms using REDCap survey on their phone um, to see if the drug is effective or not. We've already published um, three papers in JAMA two showing negative results for ivermectin, one showing negative results for fluvoxamine, and we have a publication pending on inhaled fluticasone and a manuscript about to go in on monolucas, and we're currently studying metformin. Uh, in addition to trials, we do a lot of work um, using our electronic health record data for um, not just uh, real world evidence research, but also for surveillance. So um, this is work we do with the CDC um, that, that Tom Carton at LHPI is very involved with sharing regular queries to the CDC to help inform them about issues related to COVID-19 as well as long COVID. Um, and we're also part of the NIH Recover study uh, also with strong leadership from um, LHPI, as well as from uh, the Insight CRN led out of Cornell and One Florida led out of University of Florida. Um, but we have over 40 sites from across PCORNET sharing electronic health record data to help us evaluate that data and try to understand common um, symptoms associated with long COVID, predictors of long COVID and other issues. And then finally, Vivian mentioned, we recently got funded for more of a translational study looking at the potential role of COVID-19 in progression of diabetes. So in this study, we're recruiting 1600 adult and pediatric patients who may or may have not had recent COVID-19 exposure from across 15 uh, PCORNET sites. Uh, Oshner is one of the sites that's gonna be participating in this trial and uh, in this uh, cohort study. And uh, we'll be following these patients for two years to look at the relationship between COVID-19 on diabetes progression and we're also gonna be digging deeper into that recover data. Um, so for two years, we'll follow patients with new type one or type two with the primary exposure variable being COVID. And we'll see um, how that impacts their glycemic control, but we'll also be looking at insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, inflammatory markers, vascular stiffness and some other issues over time. Sometimes we do work that's uh, much more applied and practical and not just um, a trial. 
or and and sometimes things to really just inform policy. So this is a project we did with funding from the CMS where we worked with 116 practices across the region to really teach them principles of quality improvement and teach them how to improve um, outcomes at their clinic sites as a practice transformation network. And this is work that also leveraged PCORI data um, that was led by Stacy Dusset Zina, demonstrating that uh, many Medicare patients were not filling their high cost specialty drugs because they were falling in the donut hole and it was too expensive. And um, the Biden administration used this to change the regulate to, 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 to in the Inflation Reduction Act to reduce the out of pocket costs. Um, from $7,000 to $2,000 um, for, for Medicare beneficiaries. So hopefully I've uh, convinced you that a learning and innovation health community is a valuable approach to improve individual and population health, that adopting a learning health system approach can lead to rapid performance of research studies and rapid implementation of findings um, but you do need a lot of resources to come together to support this type of learning and innovation health community. So I'll uh, just acknowledge many, many collaborators across many, many locations. This list is not complete. Um, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions and I will um, share once the evaluation QR code as part of my requirements. Thank you. across uh, your network um, with the Cornet. Um, you know, one of the things that stands out uh, as we think about the opportunity for the learning health system and the learning health community in the pragmatic space, as you pointed out in the very last slide is it does take a lot of resources to come together. Um, and even for those settings in which, you know, randomized clinical trials and NIH funding may not be um, immediately available, there may still be opportunities for hospitals such as this one uh, or our local health systems to think about how they can learn um, from there um, uh, uh, to overcome current challenges and using existing resources. When you think about the partners with whom you've engaged, um, perhaps outside of Vanderbilt, uh, who have um, perhaps fewer resources, um, maybe their hospitals are thinking about things like market share or employee retention or um, <laughs> You know, how do they get the next set of nurses uh, to stay? Um, what what um, opportunities exist to convince um, business-minded health administrators that this is an investment worth making? Yeah, great question. We struggle with our health system wants to do all those things too. Um, so you know, I I do think that um, we are working on finding the win-wins a lot of times with the health system. They, they have to figure out how to do these things. And we're finding they, they actually would appreciate our help on some of these. So, so, so I think sometimes we bring ideas to them and those are gonna be less uh, palatable if they have immediate needs. But you know, just as a few examples that they've brought to us just in the last few months, message baskets. All of the providers are overwhelmed with messages post-COVID. What interventions can we do to reduce the volume on message baskets? Virtual nursing, we started doing virtual nursing because we have a shortage of, of nurses on site. What is the value of that? How, you know, should they be investing in that? What does that look like? Pressure ulcer prevention, readmission prevention. So they, they have things they're investing a lot of money in, but they, you know, they're using consultants sometimes or they're just winging it. I mean, they're doing evaluation. I don't mean to say they're doing nothing, 
but they they would benefit from additional rigor and help in these spaces. So we're really trying to work with the health system to find those common ground as a place to get started. You know, it is a big cultural shift because they need to move fast. They need results in six months. And sometimes they see the academic side and we're like, well, we need to write the grant. We need to get the funding. We, we need to get the IRB and you know, we'll come back in two years and see if you guys still wanna do this project. So I do think we, you know, we both, both sides need to do a little bit of compromise for, for us to, to really get into this learning health system space. But I fervently believe that th there's, there's, you know, commonality there and that we can find those opportunities uh, where we can help our own health system to deliver better care and improve outcomes. Well, I have the mic first. Let me ask you to summarize the question for the people online yes. and also ask them if they have any questions. But let me get to my question. I appreciate the previous question about the business side from the hospitals and the administrators. But there's also a fair degree of paranoia about privacy, who owns the data. And you, you seem to have overcome that very well. What's the secret so that we can maybe learn from you a little bit? No, no, I don't know that we've overcome the, the issues of privacy, which are important issues for patients and for health systems. I think um, what a lot of us have done is developed approaches to try to address that. So, you know, working in de-identified data, tr working in synthetic derivatives, so synthetic data, working um, with what's called privacy preserving record linkage. So, you know, we have really had to have to build out additional approaches to really um, try to better uh, protect uh, privacy issues when, when sharing data. Um, but I, I do think we're seeing more and more push towards cloud-based research where um, people can potentially keep their data behind some kind of glass, but there's still a capacity for analyses through distributed methods and sharing of de-identified uh, data. That's a nice segue to a question I had for you. How are you incorporating uh, AI and machine learning into not just your research, but perhaps into your systems and, uh, and especially as it relates to LHS. Yeah, I, I wish I was like 20 years younger to answer that question. It's, it's moving so fast. Um, I will say we, I'm actually missing today the launch of a new center for AI uh, that's being led by Peter Amby at Vanderbilt. So we just launched today to really build this out. Um, we have participated in some big national initiatives around AI, including like Aim Ahead, for example, that's looking at the role of AI and ML and health equity issues. I, I, I do think, you know, of the areas uh, we're going next, the two I can say that we're putting a lot of energy in right now is genomics and personalized medicine, but I like to think of personalized medicine, not just to the genomics, but to the social determinants and other factors as well. And then the AI space and how do we leverage these AI tools? And I think there are a lot of tricky ethics issues there. There's a lot of tricky privacy issues, equity issues, and also um, it, we're, we're, we're very, um, cons we're very, we're moving very, carefully because of concerns about privacy as well. I take it that if you're launching an institute, you guys have put a lot of thought, you put a lot of thought, perhaps uh, had a task force working on this for some time. Uh, yeah. What sort of investment, do you have any idea what sort of investment has been made in it? This, this right now is launched as a center through our Department of Biomedical Informatics. Um, we do have a data sciences institute uh, at the campus level as well, but um, it, it's uh, an area that I am, I think we're going to be investing in more 
um, in the next few years for sure. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions and no questions online, I'd like to thank Dr. Rotman for visiting us and for giving us a wonderful lecture uh, on this topic that we are all trying to get to grips with. Thank you. Thank you.